Hi, this is Jim. I'm making a new video about uh, my reaction to Cipro. I want to share my story and uh, perhaps offer some support or education or just personal experience with what's been going on with me, what works, what doesn't. Um, so this is my second video. Uh, my first video I made was about three, four weeks ago. Um, today is 11 weeks for me since I took the Cipro. I am continuing to improve overall, but I am developing some, I guess you could say, new symptoms. So initially I'd had ankle problems, uh, Achilles and peroneal tendons, and uh, I couldn't walk. That had moved into my wrists, and so I went to the hospital, and uh, they didn't really do much for me except uh, put me in bed for six days. They had tried to force me to do rehabilitation, which I did as much as I could, kind of on a walker at that point. Um, I, can, I, can, I, can real, I realize now that that was a mistake on the medical community's part, at least there in the hospital, because they wanted to sort of approach the tendinopathy um, as if it were a traditional injury, sports-related or just regular you know, wear and tear of mobility. This is an antibiotic-induced tendinopathy, so the rehabilitation for that takes on a, a different sort of trajectory. It's not exactly a good idea to, to get someone into uh, rehabilitation, physical therapy, I mean, you know, within the first few weeks because where we have sort of a weakened structure in the tendon there um, that can cause further injury or rupture. I didn't have any ruptures, and thankfully... Up to this point, I haven't had any ruptures. I don't know how bad the tears were, or if there were tears. I feel pretty confident that there were, given the severity of the injury. I couldn't put any weight on my ankles at all. I couldn't stand up even for two or three seconds. I couldn't even get up. I couldn't lift my weight up um, there for the first four to six weeks. So, At any rate, this is 11 weeks. I am walking around now. I can stand up. I can get down the steps. Um, I, I even managed to drive my car yesterday to the pharmacy just about a mile from my house. It was very close. It wasn't a far drive. And get a refill on some meds, the only meds that I am taking. Um, so I'm on a gabapentin. Um, it's prescribed at 900 milligrams daily, 3 by 3 3 times 300. I don't take that much. Um, and actually, up until a few days ago, um, I had stopped all pharmaceuticals and I was all natural and I'll discuss with you some of the supplements in more detail about what's been working for me. Um, but because, as I said, the, the ongoing insomnia, sort of uh, difficulty concentrating, you know, the psychiatric stuff and the cognitive stuff, I was, had a lot of anxiety. I did have some suicidal ideation, especially during the first month. Uh, it was incredibly dark. Um, now, a lot of the, the severity of that is gone, but what lingers now at 11 weeks is I am noticing um, continued anxiety at times. Sometimes it completely lifts and I feel fine. It's really strange, like these windows come through and I have a lot of clarity, but then probably at least 50% of my day, I have some difficulty concentrating, um, some difficulty reading, and, uh, and I had read a lot in, you know, in the past. Um, sometimes I don't even want to watch, you know, a movie um, or YouTube, which is what I've been doing a lot to sort of uh, keep myself distracted and stay occupied. Um, so there is sort of a difficulty concentrating, so that's more cognitive. Um, also, headaches, some some pressure in my head, uh, a lot of ocular area stuff. So around the front of my face and my eyes, it's like uh, tunnel vision. Uh, this this continues. Uh, at 11 weeks, it's, you know, none of this is as bad as it was before. But I, I think that the the severity of the physical stuff has overall decreased, such that now I can sort of experience some of the other symptoms that I didn't realize, you know, were as persistent or present, which is the cognitive and emotional stuff. So I do take gabapentin for that. Not so much the cognitive stuff, although it does help with 
I think it does help a bit with concentration for us, just given the fact that we are dealing with so much anxiety, it sort of calms our mind down. Gabapentin would normally be something that kind of takes the edge off of a person that isn't dealing with anything else. I had originally been prescribed it for neuropathy in the pelvic condition, which is why I took Cipro in the first place. And um, I had been using Gabapentin for about two months. I want to just really go into detail there because I know a lot in the community uh, and the support groups that I've found, which are very, very helpful. They've been really my go-to source. Uh, a fluoroquinolone toxicity group on Facebook has thousands of users and a lot of useful information. Um, a lot of people are sort of resistant to pharmaceuticals in general now. That comes with the trauma of having this happen, which I, I perfectly understand. Um, I'm very skeptical of pharmaceuticals, but I have been taking the gabapentin throughout the experience. I was off of it. I just discontinued it. All pharmaceuticals for about a month, um, really from my last video up until now. I hadn't been on anything at all. The dose was low. Um, I, the first week was a little bit difficult. My anxiety kind of shot up a little bit coming off of it, but it didn't take long. Um, that isn't a very large dose, and I only take 300 to 600 milligrams a day maybe one before bed, and it sort of helps me sleep. Um, but it has been useful. So some people are talking about benzos. GABA pen is an anticonvulsant and also used for nerve pain. So it does help with anxiety and with uh, sleep. It really does improve my quality of sleep. Um, if you can use melatonin or some other natural supplements first, give it a shot. You know, I'm not, I'm not one way or the other there. But um, because I'd already had that prescription, um, and because I have come off of it for a month, I did notice that there is an improvement with a low dose. So um, it may be something you want to explore with your PCP, um, given what we're going through. Um, it's Like I said, it's an anticonvulsant. It's not, it's not a, an incredibly powerful drug at that level. Um, so 11 weeks, so I do have the cognitive and the emotional sort of symptoms. As far as structurally and physically... My ankles have continued to improve. Uh, they're getting stronger. The problem is because I've been so immobile, you know, I'm trying to get up and move around as much as I can. Um, I sort of force myself some days. I'm trying to find that balance between, okay, I can't lay in bed all day in atrophy. I need to, to keep my strength up or, or delay, you know, muscular atrophy as much as possible. We need our strength as much as we can. But then there's also the upper end where if you do too much, you're going to cause a new injury or aggravate and cause re-injury to joints and tendons that you've been rehabilitating. So my ankles are improving. Um, a lot of, I, I don't really, I go down the steps maybe once a day if I'm lucky. I will make a coffee and sit on my front porch and try to get outside. But I'll get up. I have a chair that I sit in here by my bed. Even being upright in your in your chair sort of works your back a little bit and it gets you moving a little bit. If you can put weight on your feet to be in a chair, you should probably try and do that. I know the first four or five weeks I really couldn't even sit in a chair. So I understand if you're one of the folks that are in the real acute phase right at the right at the onset, even that's too much. But whatever you can do, you know, um, I've been walking around. I walk to the bathroom back and forth, back and forth, and then I sit down. And I sort of stay in the chair for an hour or two if possible. And intermittently get up and go to the bathroom, even if I don't have to go. Um, and look out the window and come back. And I make, you know, as many trips as I feel like I can. Not a lot right now, but it is improving. And I am I am walking more and getting stronger where my ankles are. So that's the good news. The bad news is my shoulders are continuing to give me problems. My left elbow, my wrists are still a little bit messed up. They're not as bad as they were either. They're getting stronger. I still can't really use a phone or a computer or text like I did before. I mean, I'm, I can kind of function and hold it with one hand and sort of tap it with my left finger, but I can't hold it and text like I did before. I, I think that that's going to come back slowly. Um, it is improving, but you know, they're not anywhere near where they were, but they are improving. Um, but this elbow is giving me trouble. Both of my shoulders continue to give me trouble. And now my knees are giving me a lot of trouble. So really my whole body was affected, the, the whole connective tissue system. And hobbling around on, on two bad ankles, you know, for the last 11 weeks certainly hasn't helped. Uh, there's really just nowhere to displace the weight. You know, we can't.
there's no strong side for us. There's no strong joints for us because they're all affected, or at least in my case they were. So you're really straining your whole body, and it's a real mess. Um, my left knee is giving me some trouble. I don't know if it's meniscus or if it's joint. I am having joint pain, though I'm beginning to be able to distinguish between like tendon stuff, muscular stuff, and joint stuff. So really it's overall. It was connective tissue initially, and I think at 11 weeks what's happened is because the connective tissue has degraded and uh, you know there's been such a loss in collagen, and a connect, you know, cartilage and everything that you need, that your muscles need to make everything move. Because all of that broke down, you know, um, it's put strain on the joints, and uh, it's just causing, you know, a wide range of secondary issues, you know. So we're moving real carefully. Um, I feel like I'm in a better place than I was, but like I said, the physical stuff. Overall, I'm improved, but locally in my knees and my shoulders, I continue to have issues. In my wrists, the overall condition is better, um, but it's just, it's this is going to be a long road. Um, it's really hard to rehab this and isolate any one joint because they're all affected. So, you know, it's it's difficult. So what's been working for me? Um, I've, I've mentioned my symptoms. Uh, well, let me go down real quick a list of all the symptoms I've had to date. I think that that'll be useful. So I've, I've listed the psychiatric and cognitive uh, symptoms, and it is... Noteworthy that the FDA has recently um, forced the company, Bayer, I believe that's the company that manufactures Cipro and Leviquin, to update their warnings, which there's already, um, if I'm not mistaken, a peripheral neuropathy warning. There's the black box warning. It has a tendon rupture warning. Um, the new one is a psychiatric, so we discussed just briefly um, you know, some of the psychiatric stuff. For a lot of people, the psychiatric stuff ends up being even worse. I mean, there's a there's an increase in suicidal ideation. There's an increase in, um, or an inability sort of to regulate your emotions. So I get up, I get upset a little bit easier than I used to. Um, I have more trouble dealing with stress. This is improving, but the first four to six weeks, I was sort of perseverated and stuck and almost obsessed with trying to understand what was going on. Um, there was, uh, you know, depression and a, a lot of anxiety. This uh, drug uh, affects the um, GABA receptors in our brain. So that's, that's a big one for anxiety. Um, so the new warning, at any rate, the reason I'm going into all that, includes psychiatric symptoms for this drug. This is a recent warning. It's uh, August of 2018. That's the most recent warning. So this is, as, as those of us who, who are going through, you know, a, a, being floxed or being poisoned, having an adverse reaction, we know that there's a lot more stuff that comes with what's just on the warning. A tendon rupture can result in secondary issues in your knees and other joints because you, you've got a, a tendon rupture you know, in one joint. That's just really the beginning of it. So we understand that. But at least they're getting the main stuff uh, on the box. So the symptoms, psychiatric stuff. Um, like I said, uh, there's some emotional dysregulation. I have a little bit more trouble sort of uh, keeping my emotions in check anger, um, sadness. Um, I get upset a little more easily than I did. Um, this is still going on a bit, but it's improved. Um, and I think that that stuff is on its way out. But um, So there was an increase in anxiety. Um, so those are the emotional or psychiatric sort of components. The cognitive issues I'd had were, these are my symptoms uh, from the beginning. Um, the cognitive issues I'd had were a difficulty concentrating. I had sort of a tunnel vision. Um, sometimes I get flashes of light on the left, like on the peripheral sides of my vision. <clears throat> so my executive functioning has been affected somewhat, and that is also beginning to improve. That's what that brain fog, that's what people mean when they say a fog. It's just a sort of blunt force over your, your ability to concentrate that makes it difficult to sort of process information. So I experienced all of that. Um, that was the, the, you know, the, the psychological or the mental health symptoms. The physical symptoms that I'd had were tendinopathy in my ankles, in my wrists, in my knees, and in my shoulders, my elbows. So really all my connective tissue was affected. I was on a steroid for about six weeks prior to taking the Cipro. So I think that's had a lot 
to do with uh, what's happened to me. I only took the one pill. Anyway, I, I don't know if this is helpful to anyone or not. I'm just running down the symptoms that I'd had. Um, also, intracranial pressure, like uh, my, my head was being pushed in a vice. I had uh, headaches, some really bad headaches that were uncharacteristic. I had a racing heart, tachycardia. Uh, let's see. No urinary issues or bowel issues. Some constipation, but um, I don't know if that was related to the Cipro or not. Um, so that was pretty much it, but it's been a hell of a, hell of a mess. Um, so that's the rundown of, of my symptoms up to date. 11 weeks, am improving, psychological stuff is improving, my clarity is coming back, um, my emotional regulation sort of grip on, uh, on stress is coming back. Uh, physically, still dealing with uh, system-wide, body-wide, joint, ligament, tendon issues. Uh, but that's, some of that's just secondary. It's because we're laid up in bed so long. It's just really difficult to rehab any one particular joint or one particular local region, one particular spot, one particular ankle, one particular knee, one particular elbow, because they're all messed up. Um, but that's improving uh, slowly. Just being real careful. So what's working for me? Uh, let's see. I tried a lot of supplements. Um, we got into this a little bit last time. It was uh, the, the five basic tips that I'd given last time were obviously stop taking the Cipro. That's a given. I wouldn't even count that. You know. Number one, don't take any steroids. Number two, don't take the NSAIDs like ibuprofen, Aleve, and Advil. That class of drugs are contraindicated with fluoroquinolones, along with the steroids, which are contraindicated with fluoroquinolones. Do not take those drugs. Number three, you need an oral magnesium supplement. Number four, you need uh, probiotics. And uh, I'm sorry, I can't remember number five right now. That's probably some of my cognitive issues. That's what we'll, we'll call that. We'll chalk that up. But it's in my first video. Those basic, uh, those are all natural treatments have helped. They made a difference. Um, I want to update and kind of go into a little more detail here with these supplements that are working for me, the treatment that I'm using so far. So I still haven't been back to any of my doctors. I was uh, supposed to see a rheumatoid specialist eventually when I'm healthy enough to actually get out of my house and get around in the community. Um, I will do that. Um, you need a support system. I don't know. We're all in individual situations here. Everybody has different capacities, what we can all scrape up for money, for support from friends and family. I'm in a tough situation, but there are a lot of people that have stepped up to come through for me. You need to find some people to help you out, obviously, because we can't do this on our own. I have people helping me get my groceries. I have people giving me money, donating money to me, friends, um, family. Um, a lot of people have stepped up to help me out here. Um, so and I'm very grateful for them because I can't, I can't make it without them. And, uh, I am improving with their help. Um, so, some of the money that uh, I do have, I don't have a lot, but I am allocating that to the purchase of supplements after I do a lot of homework. As I said, the Facebook group, Fluoroquinolone Toxicity group, it's on Facebook. There are a few. I think that one's the best. Again, it's called Fluoroquinolone Toxicity Group. That's been the best, probably, overall source of information. Um, obviously, you can use Google to sort of corroborate or look up and research what those folks have to say. I'm in the group. I make comments and sort of uh, am supportive with those people uh, and with newcomers to the group. Interestingly, what I'm finding in that group is about half of the people that are there, and there are several thousand members, and obviously there are a lot more people out there that are going through this and aren't a part of that group. You're here on YouTube. Maybe you found this video uh, there in that page, I have posted this video on Reddit. Um, there is uh, our Floxies. There's a couple other places you can go for support online. Um, Floxyhope.com is a good website with uh, more encouraging stories. Some of the basics that I've found up to this point, some of the personal experience has been that it, it's a mixed bag because I have courtesy of those people and those websites and the research found a lot of useful information. And, uh, and I wouldn't be as well off as I am now if it hadn't been for those sites and some of those individuals. On the other hand, there's a lot of negative that comes with that. And it's a very difficult sort of experience sometimes to be in those groups and follow those feeds. 
because there are a lot of people that are very, very bad off, and we all know where they're at, right? We know what they're going through, and um, there are some people that have been going through it for years. There are newcomers that are just absolutely devastated, and there are people that that are two or three years out, and they're 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 having relapses. Um, there's a lot of suffering and a lot of you know negative emotions that you can offer support to when you're strong, but to dwell constantly in those places can have a negative effect on, on one's own well-being. So I dial it back sometimes on the sites and on the research because if you're not careful, you end up going down a rabbit hole of mitochondrial damage and what's going to happen to me in the future or my organs going to fail. And uh, there's a lot of negative events that are loosely associated with mitochondrial toxicity that may happen, but that may not happen, right? They may not happen. A lot of people do recover. So the good site is, um, the one that's more based on recovery is floxyhope.com. That's a good one. It, uh, it has a lot of people that recovered, some people 90, 85, 90, or 100%. Uh, and they did it, you know, within six months or a year, they're back to normal. So there are good stories as well. Take those, take those sites in the internet uh, with caution, uh, realize that there's a lot to be gained from those sites, a lot of useful information, and I mean that. Um, it's not just about validation and making you feel better. There are a lot of people there that, that know how to treat this. There's a lot of us that have gone through it that learn pretty quick what's going on. But then there's a lot of the, the sadness and the suffering that come along with it uh, of others, and you want to try to help them. You just can't help everybody when you need to be helping yourself. So there's a line there. Offer support when you can, and then come back and rest when you can. Watch a movie or something. Um, here's what I found interestingly on those sites. And I don't, I don't have any statistics or any numbers, but it seems like about half the people on those sites sort of realize right away, within the first week or the first month of taking the antibiotic, whether it was Cipro or Leviquin or Avalox. Now, there's a whole range of fluoroquinolones that you need to be familiar with. Before you're treated with any antibiotic, you need to go online and look that up. There are resources available on those in those groups, and obviously on Google, it's not difficult to find. I probably should post some of these links in the comment section of this video. Maybe I will try to do that at some point. Excuse me. So, before you take any antibiotics, you need to be familiar that fluoroquinolones are a large class of drugs. There are eardrops and eye drops that are given. There are fluoroquinolones. They give these to children. It's very, very uh, bad news. In my opinion, um, you should never treat a child with fluoroquinolone antibiotics. So if you have kids and they're given eardrops or eye drops for some kind of an infection, you need to research what kind of drug that is. Because if it's a fluoroquinolone, that's bad news. So uh, let's see, where were we? Some of the some of the folks that come to those websites, about the first fifty percent, half of the people seem to have known right away that that the antibiotic that they took, that the, the fluoroquinolone caused their symptoms, and there was no doubt in their mind. And it didn't really matter what the doctors said because we knew what happened to us, right? I was one of those people. I knew it the first day, and uh, certainly by the seventh day, by that first week, when uh, my my ankles turned to jelly. I knew that it was Cipro. There was no question. Um, but the other half of the people that sort of straggle in to those websites, unfortunately, are people that are at six months, they're at a year. In some cases, there are people that they took stories, there's stories, they, they took Cipro whenever, uh, back in 2015, they remember, and suddenly they're having tendon issues, or they took some steroids and they're having tendon issues, or there's something going on with their liver, um, they're, they're, they're developing symptoms that don't make any sense either because they've taken another med that's contraindicated with the Cipro or because it's just happening. They can't make any sense out of it. And they do a little bit of research on Google and then they find that group online and they realize, you know, a couple years later or six months later, oh my gosh. So there's about half of the folks that come into that group are six months or later having symptoms. They don't really know what's going on. So this is really important. If you know people that have taken this drug, you have friends or loved ones that are taking this drug. Um, this can affect you months and years later. 
So you should check with your friends and family if they're having issues, any, any sort of really medical complaint at all. Um, I would ask them if, if they've ever taken a fluoroquinolone antibiotic. Now, I don't know how much good that's going to do in their, uh, their medical experience because a lot of the doctors, as I've said, are not supportive. Sometimes they're almost outright aggressive and combative. They absolutely refuse. In my case, they've absolutely refused and denied that a fluoroquinolone could have caused this. It's very frustrating. But then sometimes you do have doctors that will at least acknowledge it's possible. And that's important because you at least need to get it down if you have had an adverse reaction that you're allergic to them. So about half the people come in and they don't realize that they've been floxed and um, they're developing symptoms much later after the drug. Because it's a mitochondrial toxicant, you may not develop symptoms until much later. And there is relevant and valid scientific research supporting what I've just said to you um, that the onset of symptoms can occur after, you know, weeks, after months. Um, so this is not a drug that you're having an allergic reaction to. The, uh, the anaphylaxis is extremely rare with this drug, and people don't understand because of the nature of, of, of the mechanism. The process, the action of the drug, doesn't typically cause an allergic response. It's a mitochondrial um, toxicity, which takes on the shape of any range of symptoms and issues, cognitive, you know, structural, connective tissue, organs. It, it can present differently in all people because of the genetic component. It can express itself in any number of ways. So we're all going through a different experience, but we do have a lot in common. And that's what will bring me to my next sort of topic here. Back to what's working. The treatments that have made a difference, um, as I said, probiotics, now, to discuss briefly more probiotics, you can drop a lot of money on probiotics on Amazon. I use a yogurt, an Activa yogurt, that has active cultures in it every day. I feel like it is making a difference. It's not that expensive. You can get into some of the bigger bucks buying more exotic strains of probiotics. I don't know. I haven't tried it. I mean, it's not stuff you can get on a grocery shelf, as I understand it. You have to go on Amazon. It's 30 or 40 bucks for a month or two months supply. Um, People are having mixed results. Some people swear by it. Some people can't take it. It's, it causes a lot of problems for them. So, one way or the other, and you know, if you want to give it a shot, give it a shot. But there's more exotic strains of probiotics available on Amazon. I use simply an Activa yogurt that you can buy at your local grocery store with probiotics. Um, the next supplement is a magnesium supplement. There's glycinate, there's chlorate, there's chloride, there's a number of different magnesium supplements. I take a multi-supplement, magnesium, calcium, D3, and zinc. Those all kind of work together. So um, I don't know a lot about the interactions between certain minerals and others or certain supplements like zinc and its interaction with magnesium. Sometimes they balance each other out. But that multi-supplement seems to be helping. Um, I did take a lot at first, double to triple the daily dose. I'm back down to about the regular daily dose which is 400 or 500 milligrams a day of the magnesium, but it's really important. Magnesium is crucial to the folks that have been floxed because there is a link between magnesium deficiency and people that have been adversely affected by fluoroquinolones. We are depleted in magnesium in our muscles, and that affects the joints, the tendons, and all the connective tissue when our muscles aren't functioning properly. So we need to get our magnesium. The reason that I dropped the oral supplement is because now, this is not a product placement, but um, and, and there are multiple uh, oils available. This is a topical magnesium spray. It's a magnesium oil. Um, you can see the brand if you like. I'm not selling their product. Um, I'm not even going to mention the brand name. This is available on Amazon. This is this was uh, 18 or 19 dollars. It's a 12 ounce bottle. This is going to last me probably three or four weeks. Um, there are other Magnesium oil is available. I don't think that one would be any better or worse than the other. As long as it's elemental magnesium, one spray of that is about 25 milligrams. So eight sprays is about 250 milligrams of magnesium topically there. I'm, I'm showing this bottle because, and I have a lot of other supplements that I've tried that I'm not going to really uh, promote um, as just as a, as, as a general product, not as a specific product. Again, I'm not selling anything here at all. Um, I'm not into that, 
But this stuff here, the, the magnesium spray, whatever kind you buy, none of the treatments that I've used up to this point, nothing has brought me the relief, the amazing, almost instantaneous results is that spray. I spray about five or six sprays. I'm using it on my whole body. I hit every ankle, both ankles, both knees, I hit my elbows, my wrists, my shoulders, five or six sprays. You can use an Epsom salt bath. Uh, a lot of people swear by that. That's probably going to give you the same basic effect because Epsom salts are primarily magnesium. Whatever you do, I recommend an oral magnesium supplement and some sort of topical magnesium treatment, whether it's a spray or an Epsom salt bath. That stuff has been absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. It loosened me up. It improved my flexibility, and it felt like it gave me some of my strength and range of motion back that I haven't felt since this happened nearly three months ago. And it happened that quickly. Um, it was really amazing. So highly recommend that you get yourself some sort of topical magnesium. What else I'm using? I'm not going to show any more supplements. Um, but what I have added to my regimen, so I've tried a lot of stuff. Now, I'm not going to say one way or the other, take this. Well, no, I am going to give you some recommendations of what you should and what you shouldn't. But, but because this is a unique experience to each of us, I think some of it is placebo, but, but there is a lot of science beyond, for example, the magnesium. You can find a lot of research that will add to the credibility of a supplement or sort of leave it in question. I've tried some of the stuff that's in question, and I've tried some of the supplements that have scientific research and medical research behind it indicating that it should work. I've had experiences where some of the supplements that I've taken without a lot of support did seem to provide a benefit. And I've had a lot of uh, experience where supplements like alpha lipoic acid, ALA, does have pretty good support behind it, improving neuropathy and some of the neuropathic stuff that we're having issues with where it's supposed to work. And I didn't really notice much of a difference. And I tried these for a month. You know, most of these supplements take some time to build up and to feel any sort of effect. Um, you got to give them at least two or three weeks in most cases. You're not going to have an instant sort of relief with the exception of that magnesium topical treatment. So as I said, I've tried, uh, I think one was called Cissus Extract, which is good for regenerating uh, tendons and, and connective tissue. I've tried alpha lipoic acid. I've tried a whole bunch of stuff that's hit or miss. That stuff, I can't really say one way or the other. Um, what has seemed to, what, what there is seems to be a consensus, there is a consensus among, among us in the community. Magnesium is a big one. Probiotics is a big one. The third one that I would recommend that you go, I'm going into more detail here, um, with the supplements, this, this uh, seems to be a big one, is collagen. You can get that in bone broth. You can get that in a powder. I'm taking an oral supplement. There's different types of collagen, type 1, 2, 3, and I think 4. You can find supplements and powder that have all the types of collagen. 